modern period, her publications have focused on the marriage contract. The first book is in marriage, exchange, property, and social place in the cities of the Low Countries. The Low Countries are her special focus and specialization. Uh, more work on women production and patriarchy in the late medieval uh, cities. Uh, and most recently, Commerce Before Capitalism in Europe. Uh, she's also worked on questions related to sources with colleagues uh, in uh, Europe, uh, all uh, from reliable sources. And presently, she's working on the culture of credit in Northern Europe. So this is very much in you know, connected. Uh, she also, uh, embarking on teaching, has now uh, been thinking about the Dutch in the wider world and questions related to early capitalism and commerce and trade in global perspective. Uh, Madeline Zellin, uh, uh, speaking out also, especially with the Chinese case, but probably has a uh, breadth of work on Chinese legal and economic history. Uh, written, she's written very widely on the evolution of shareholding and business organization in China, state handling of economic disputes and wars and changes in commerce as new sites for economic so on this whole institutional uh, framework. Uh, her earliest works include uh, The Magistrate's Tale uh, from the mid-1980s. She's the co-editor of work on contract and property rights in early modern China. And she's especially well known in the prize, uh, as we've all pointed out, for uh, recent work on the merchants of Ligong, industrial enterprise in early modern uh, China. Uh, Last uh, but not least, this kind of third way approach, Richard Bullock is uh, renowned Islamist uh, with wide ranging interests, moving from his earliest work on the patricians of uh, Nishapur, his 1972 study of his medieval uh, Islamic social history, and then he's done work that's somewhat different in emphasis from uh, our uh, two uh, colleagues working on uh, China and Europe, respectively, uh, that is his work on. Camel on the Wheel, a uh, book from the mid 1970s, 1975, Cop Climate and Camels of Early Islamic Iran, uh, a work on hunters and herders and hamburgers, uh, the past and future human animal relations, uh, then wider work on the case for Islamic, Islamic Christian civilization, came out in 2004, and then wider still uh, <laughs> uh, on uh, the global history which he teaches, expressed in editorship of the Columbia history of the 20th century, and very more recently his textbook on birth and its peoples. Uh, he, I should add, is trying to retire, but we're blocking him. <laughs> so. so let's, why don't we start uh, uh, with, with, with me. Uh, okay, so, so let me just start by saying I'm not going to try and replicate the, the thesis of the book, although I, I have to say, you know, in some respects the thesis is fairly simple. It has to do with well, I won't, I won't even try. Um, well, I don't know, because not, not everybody's read it, so you tell me if I'm wrong. I mean, you start out by saying politics is important. The key, is, the key to your thesis has to do with spatial divergences that, that emerge uh, in Europe and China, um, and that ultimately, due to the cost of war that exists in the competitive state system in Europe, as opposed to the what I'm going to call a peace dividend in the Chinese case, we see the urban basis of manufacturing developing more, more substantially in Europe uh, and a rur more rural-based um, uh, manufacturing uh, going on in China. That is sort of the basic, but there's so much more in the book. I mean, the book is so th thick with, with things to talk about that I had a very hard time uh, thinking what exactly I would do, especially because I know most of you in the room probably haven't read the book yet, although I hope because we posted it, you were able to at least read some of the, the chapters. And, and also, I, I, I think it's very clear, and I'm sure Ben is running into this, that as soon as you have an overarching thesis like this, even if you very modestly say, we are not trying to have the final word on the Great Divergence, that there are going to be a lot of people who attack the project just for trying to be so Broad, and there'll be a lot of people who want to pick at every, you know, every little <laughs> point and every little fact, and so on. So I'm going to try not to do either one of those. Uh, I want to start out 
partly because I know there are a lot of students here and a lot of students who don't do economic history. So I, I want to start out by saying some of the things that I really like about this book and, and reasons that you should read it and reasons why you shouldn't be afraid that there are equations in it. Um, well, they're not really well, because there's narratives. Boxes. Yeah, there are little boxes they're and then there are boxes. right and then there are narratives that really explain to you and, and, and actually it's like they really do go a long way in saying these economic historians who just use equations, it, the emperor has no clothes because it really is a logical way of laying out an understanding of the world. So, so f first of all, I want to say that in doing so, a lot of I mean, a lot of scholars focus on the impact of institutions, both in the way that Bin defined them and also in, in the way that I think people more generally understand the understand them as you know, as, as physical things, um, uh, the impact of institutions on development. And uh, one of the things that I really love about this book, it's something that I, I think a lot of what I do is based on and, and that I urge all of you to keep really in your minds is this notion that different institutions can play similar roles. That, that when, when humanity in its many contexts are faced with similar problems, there are many institutional solutions that can be found in that, and that it's not necessarily the case that there are good ones and bad ones, although there may be good ones and bad ones, but, but that needs to be investigated. Uh, and I think that's one of the most important implications of the book and also of a lot of the, of the models that you, that you draw. Um, also, like many economic historians, Bin and Jean Laurent have structured their arguments around models of economic behavior. Uh, models, are, are, models are based on assumptions, right? They're, they, they're based on assumptions that economic activity can be simplified and represented in particular ways. And as been said, sometimes people will disagree about those assumptions. Uh, I found that most of their assumptions, at least when I'm looking at the China side, made sense. Uh, and also that human decision making is based on so-called rational choices. This is perhaps more contentious in, in looking at the ways in which these models uh, are designed. And, and Bin talked about the model that I was going to talk about, that is the model that, that tries to explain when you have formal and informal um, informal um, enforcement mechanisms uh, in, in uh, credit transactions and trade relations, so I don't have to talk about that, and that saves a little bit of time. Uh, modeling can be full of foot, uh, pitfalls, and I think, to their credit, one of the other things that I like about the book is that Bin and Jean Laurent have made very judicious use of their models. Um, and I, 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 I want to speak for historians whose work is largely empirical that I really en enjoyed and really appreciated the fact that whenever you had a model, you always went back to the, the stuff on the ground to try and see, how, to test whether it really works in the real world. And, and, and that, for that alone, I think you also ought to read the book because a lot of people don't do that. Uh, and then finally, Bin and Jean Laurent, um, depend on this combination of modeling and empirical testing to debunk some of the most enduring and irksome, uh, and I really mean irksome, uh, explanations that are put forward for Chinese economic development trajectories, um, which, which now I think really do give us something more than just an intuitive arsenal to attack people like David Landis and others. So for those of you who aren't as deeply steeped in the literature that, uh, as some of us are, uh, they, they really go into the question of whether differences in family structure were at fault, uh, whether the presence or absence of formal legal institutions were at fault, uh, specific kinds of legal regimes. There are many, 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 many books that say that certain kinds of property rights are necessary for development and certain kinds, i.e. Chinese, are not. Um, the need for representative governmental institutions. Uh, you spoke of Weber, but there's a much broader question about different kinds of cultural endowments and so on. And, and they really do try to deal with each of them in both a theoretical and an empirical way. And I, I think you'll find that very, very valuable. 
Um, it's also worth noting that that Bin and Jean Laurent are writing at a time when it's really no longer possible to deny that divergence is actually something that happens at a moment in time. This is sort of something you said in that wonderful talk that that you gave on, um, I guess, on the Aztecs or on the on well, yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. right. Uh, but th this notion that somehow we have a primordial West and a primordial every place else, and never the twain shall meet, uh, although we can disagree about specifics and we can disagree about when things happen, uh, I think that that the book uh, benefits from not having to have that argument, even though I'm going to have that argument with you in a minute. Um, and I'm not going to talk about Ken Pomerantz because you already did. Um, but I will say, uh, so let me, let me skip over my Pomerantz, Bin Wong's Jean Laurent comments and, and say that um, it seems to me that central to the book's argument, as I just said, is, that, is a claim that China experienced what we might call a long-term peace dividend that was the result both of its large size and its centralized state system, and that this peace dividend allowed for low taxation and robust provision of public goods, in contrast to the way that you depict Europe, uh, which is saddled with, for various reasons, high taxes and low provision of public goods uh, before the Industrial Revolution. So far OK? I, I, I say so with uh, anxious anticipation. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's the, um, so first of all, I want to say, um, as someone who, whose early work focused a lot on, on the tax system in the early Qing, that I can attest to the fact that everything you say about low taxation and, um, and the dramatically low burden of taxation on uh, on the commercial sector in China and the lack of barriers to trade and so on and so forth, this is accepted. This is, this is not debatable. It, it, it is ex exactly the way that the mainstream in the field uh, understands uh, that. Um, now scholars, there are, there are scholars like, for example, Mark Elvin, who some of you might have read, who've explored the implications of this, what you might call a continental free trade zone for innovation and investment and, and thought about it in, in a lot of ways. In some ways, Elvin's high level equilibrium trap depends on this, this uh, continental free trade zone, if you will. But none of them have linked low taxation, open markets, and state policy in quite the way that your book does. Um, so I want to ask you some questions. Um, and they're not the only questions, and maybe they're not even the most important questions, but I'll just throw them out. First of all, a big part of the argument, it seems to me, has to do with the provision of public goods. Um, and so I, I was wondering how, first of all, how do we measure the Qing provision of public goods? One, one of the things that I have to say, being a Chinese historian is very frustrating because it's hard to measure anything, no way. Um, <laughs> um, but, but I think, so I, I want to I ask, would we ha expect different consequences if a large portion of this revenue that you say is devoted to public goods uh, is devoted to famine relief and flood control as opposed to, say, road and bridge building? Um, and indeed, I, I'll leave it there, although I'll just say Lily and Lee. So you'll know what I was thinking about, because Lillian argues that a lot of this infrastructure work is actually uh, a ne has negative uh, implications. Um, now, a number of the, another thing that I was going to ask you about: a number of critics of the book have have questioned, and I, I must say I was thinking about this as well: the characterization of China as relatively free of military expenses, and that having uh, uh, and, 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 of, uh, and of warfare, and of that having a major impact on the difference in the way in which the trade system and the manufacturing system develop. Um, and and um, I, 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 how, so first of all, how do you take into account the late Ming and early Qing experience of extremely costly rebellions, wars of dynastic tra transition, that go on, for those of you in the European field, 
from, uh, from a around 1600 to at least the 1680s. And then they're followed by costly wars of westward expansion, wars against indigenous populations um, that don't necessarily affect the, the markets of, uh, of eastern China, but they certainly bankrupt the state. And indeed, we, we know, and this we do have data for, that the state goes from surplus in the early 18th century to deficit in the late 18th century. OK, so that's another question. I'll ask the third question, and then I'll stop because Vicki wants me to. No, I um, Yeah, no, I understand. <laughs> OK, so the third question that I was going to ask uh, has to do with the causes of this, of this spatial divergence. And, and in fact, you, you devote the first chapter sort of to it, and I found that the most difficult chapter to wrap my head around. Um, in fact, it may not be necessary, it may not be possible to explain why China stays unified and why Europe breaks up, um, but, but the explanation for me is just not there yet, and in fact, on page 16, you say something which I can only describe as tautological. You say that the Chinese rulers were able to reconsolidate the vast empire that emerged in, I don't know if this is a quote or not, uh, that emerged in early China because they learned from their mistakes and were able to deliver internal order and welfare enhancing projects, and the Europeans were not. <laughs> I mean, basically, that, that somehow they faced competition. Well, the Chinese faced competition also, as you know, uh, you know, really after the Han Dynasty falls, we have, a, uh, we have a, a state system which is really rather fragmented and doesn't really come back together until the Middle Ages. Um, towards the end of the book, you throw in a comparison between Machiavelli and Confucius, which I don't think you really need to be an explanation for the differences in the state systems. Um, in one point in the book, and, and I'm saying this particularly for Dick because this is the kind of thing I think that you would often get your teeth around, you make a very playful reference to the fact that the Mongols conquered all of China, but they didn't get quite far enough in Europe. Maybe that's the reason why China is unified and, and Europe ends up not being uh, unified. But I'm going to stop. Uh, the talk, nevertheless, I found absolutely fascinating because I look at it from an Ottoman standpoint. Mm -hmm. Here you have an empire that is territorially spacious uh, next to Europe. It has no wars, except on the frontiers, the sorts of wars that Manny's talking about. So that, let's say, Egypt, Syria, um, uh, oh, most of Anatolia uh, go without war for three to four centuries. Uh, and it has, unlike Europe, it, uh, where you have the uh, de-urbanization from the Roman Empire, you do not have de-urbanization. Instead, you have uh, massive urbanization. And so it's a highly urbanized uh, part of the world. It develops long distance trade uh, early and develops all of the informal uh, inst institutions that you talked about that associate with an early development of long distance trade. And yet it also develops formal institutions particularly in the context of Islamic law and Ottoman administration. Um, so that uh, these are simply some of the factors that would lead me to think, well, uh, why are we talking about Europe and China when we would use those same terms and simply talk about Europe and its, and its next door neighbor, the Ottoman Empire? Uh, and yet the, the Ottoman Empire never gets drawn into it because you did not have, no one's ever been able to, to arrange, and they can't because you're going to no back it up that you had a kind of um, potential for, uh, for uh, industrialization in terms of uh, gross measures of, of, um, of output of coal or uh, things like that. Um, but it is interesting that uh, among the most dynamic economies in the world today, you have Turkey, uh, which is um, you know, the core of that, of that empire. So being a old fashioned on a least and technological historian, uh, I look for other factors that uh, strike me as being germane, um, uh, not so much in why there, there was a divergence of the sort that we've been talking about, but simply why these two neighboring areas uh, that are both 
heirs of Greco-Roman antiquity and the Hellenistic toolkit of ideas and scientific concepts and so forth, why these two diverge. I agree entirely with, uh, uh, with the speaker in terms of my rejection of cultural differences. I think that that has been the uh, uh, shibboleth in the field of Middle East studies. And I also think that uh, the whole notion of comparison suffers from the fact that, um, that the field of Middle Eastern history has been pretty much brain dead for the last several generations uh, in that virtually no one asks crucial questions. And therefore, we don't have the sort of conceptual base that would allow us to make that comparison. Uh, there's recently a book uh, trying to draw India into this uh, great divergence right. thing, uh, Parta, uh, right. uh, Parta Sarati's book. But nobody works on the Middle East because nobody does that kind of history. That, that's a fault of the field, not a fault of, of either the source materials uh, or of, of the interest in it. So I'd, I'd just like to make uh, three points that I think are are germane. Uh, one is that I think we have a very important issue in the cost of energy. Uh, the cost of energy in, um, uh, in Europe um, is associated with uh, trying to, to harness uh, water power and wind power through uh, water mills and windmills, uh, which has a very high investment cost, but has a very uh, good long-term uh, product, and many of the people who were most important, my understanding of it, in the development of European uh, industry were people who, a generation who back, had backgrounds in the military business, because they are the ones who knew how to, how to transmit energy uh, from a, uh, say, from a water mill to a group of looms or saw mill operation or something like that. They had the technical skills, they knew how to do that. Um, but the water mills, uh, the mills that you have in Europe, uh, are not there before, um, before the 12th century. Um, you have a massive increase in, uh, in mills um, in the 11th and 12th, 13th centuries. Um, and um, that is something that does not occur uh, in the Middle East. Part of the reason is, is, I believe, because there's a period of great population growth in Europe where uh, where the question of the cost of animal power, which is your primary alternative, uh, is, uh, goes up because uh, humans and animals compete for the same feed grains. The important thing, in my view, is that throughout the Arab arid zone, down to the present day, the, uh, the feeding cost of uh, laboring animals is approximately zero. Uh, we actually have uh, you know, good economic studies that demonstrate this. There's a, study in Pakistan done in 1985 showing that for someone renting out a camel for labor, it's a wonderful budget that says uh, 200, um, you know, 260 uh, working days per year, cost of food zero. Uh, 100 leisure days per year, cost of food zero. You know, if your energy cost is that low, you will not invest in water mills or windmills, even if you have the technology, which they did have in the Middle East. So that you had something of the same dilemma we have now, where gasoline prices are too low, or for a long time were too low, to encourage investment in alternative forms. Uh, so that's uh, that's the first point. A second point is that there was a uh, a massive change in the balance of economic capacity between Europe and the Middle East that set in primarily in the 11th, 12th, 13th centuries. Uh, 11th, 12th centuries uh, are periods of uh, great exuberance in Europe, uh, supported largely by what's called the medieval warm period, the great warming of the European climate. This coincides in the Middle East with a period of extraordinary cold, mm -hmm. so that you have a, uh, the opposite climate effect. You have depopulation, loss of agricultural production, uh, and uh, all sorts of terribly deleterious effects because of a cold, a uh, period that runs from roughly um, uh, mid 900s down to, to say 1130 or so. Uh, I've written about this in my book on cotton climate and camels in early Islamic Iran. More recently, uh, Roddy Ellenberg of Hebrew University has written an entire book on the decline of, of, of Eastern Mediterranean uh, in, in the 11th century. And I think it's going to become understood that the shift in the balance between Europe and, and the Islamic Middle East uh, had an exogenous uh, uh, cause. 
or certain exogenous causes. Um, then just one word in the Miller business, but let, let me just come back to you. If, if you track European history, you find that the two most important trades in terms of surnames are Miller and, and Smith. Uh, the people who work with iron, the people who work with water or wind. Uh, and you look at American surnames, uh, whether it's Ferraro and Molinari, or whether it's Schmidt and Mueller, or whether it's Miller and Smith, these are the two important. Look at the American surnames for, for Arabic. Most of common surname for Arabs is Haddad, meaning Smith. There are no Millers, uh, because milling uh, was a single animal operation that never rose to an industrial level because you didn't have any way of multiplying. You had no, no energy takeoff to be used to turn a mill into a factory. Uh, final point, um, uh, the comments on uh, time and distance with respect to, uh, to transactions uh, simply inevitably raise the question of, um, of uh, speed and efficiency of land transport. Mm -hmm. And uh, th because you, your, your kilometers or your, your weeks uh, and so forth have to be conditioned by how fast you, you can move. Uh, a fundamental fact of European history is that contrary to, to economic efficiency or good sense, uh, the Europeans, for hundreds and hundreds of years, retained the use of four-wheeled vehicles that are intrinsically inferior to two-wheeled vehicles. China, everywhere else in the world, China, India, Japan, everywhere else in the world uses two-wheeled vehicles. But modern transport is predicated on the concept of a four-wheeled platform carrying an engine. All of the development that you have from the carriage revolution of roughly 1600 onward in terms of improving roads, brakes, steering, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera uh, becomes the, um, the template, uh, builds the template upon which modern motor transport, particularly railroads to begin with, uh, is built. And no other part of the world was stupid enough to, uh, to, to, to use uh, four-wheeled transport, and therefore they never developed that that interest that that cost, and therefore they never developed uh, they never developed the infrastructure. Now, why the Europeans did this um, is a topic of my next book. <laughs> is it really? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, now, can you tell us? That, yeah. <laughs> yes, I, I, I can tell you uh, very briefly. I, I don't want to intrude on your time. Um, when you look at pictures of four-wheeled vehicles um, outside the, the narrow Roman stratum, um, they're almost all passenger vehicles. Uh, and you do not see them being used to, to carry cargo because as soon as you add the second axle, you double the friction, thereby decreasing your payload. And therefore, they make no sense to put cargo in a four-wheeled vehicle. Um, but when you look at the passenger vehicles, as you move into the medieval period of the rise of knighthood, no man of status could rise in a vehicle. Uh, read uh, Chrétien Toise, uh, the, the Knight of the, of, the, of the Car. A man would be disgraced by riding in a vehicle unless he was old or infirm. Uh, and almost all the pictures are, of these vehicles are women, uh, particularly high status women being moved with a retinue of, of female retainers. And four wheeled vehicle, the inefficiency of four, inefficiency of four wheeled vehicles was the price Europe paid to move its women, whereas other parts of the world, two-wheeled vehicles, simply did not move the women. They left them at home because the cost of moving a princess and her retinue from here to there was, was enormous. The exception, of course, is Mongol Central Asia, where women sensibly rode horses. But, um, but it, it, it's one of these curious things where it's the gender history of Europe that uh, uh, that, that plays a role in the retention and, uh, and indeed in the improvement to have a smoother ride, a smoother roadmap of, um, of field transport. So Europe ended up unconsciously and because and for reasons that had nothing to do with economics with a uh, step toward, uh, toward narrowing the time and space uh, factor in transactions that no other part of the world was prepared to, uh, to do in in the same sense. Let me begin, as everybody else began, by uh, thanking our, our presenter. I found this uh, presentation enormously clarifying. I had read chapters of the book, and in fact, what I'm going to talk about for part of my remarks are chapter four, which is the chapter on warfare, which is really sort of the heart of 
the causal argument of this book, as Maddie pointed out. So, um, uh, but I did find a presentation that explained more the methodology, just exactly what they were trying to do methodologically, very useful and helpful. Uh, but I'm speaking as a specialist to the socioeconomic history of late medieval Europe into the 16th and 17th century. Um, and some of what I have to say is, you know, inside baseball, um, a little uh, uh, the specialist quibble. Um, what I'm not going to do is quibble too much and stay with the really tiny things. And I wanted to say just parenthetically, the argument about informal and formal mechanisms, first of all, I think it's empirically right that European historians are agreed that informal mechanisms were a key part of the credit system, um, whether the kind of two, you know, the two by two table or the three by three table perfectly captures the complexity, I'm not sure. But certainly the mix that you described, I agree with. But let me turn just first, I have the, my quibble question, which I think leads to a bigger issue. And then I have um, some comments at the end about method, uh, about the risks and rewards of this kind of method with respect to the story in Europe. And of course, I'm going to talk just about Europe because I don't know anything about China, and I presume that's why I was asked. Um, the central argument is, is that early in Europe's history, medieval history, um, cities developed um, as havens, as sort of refuges against, from a warlike exterior. And when Europe industrialized, and industrialized in cities because cities were safer, and because capital was cheaper in cities. Um, now cities may have been safer on average than the countryside, although I don't really know how you measure the cost of the higher mortality in cities because of uh, disease, which the book acknowledges, um, against the cost of warfare, particularly because periods of warfare in Europe it was very uneven. And exactly the period of European dramatic urbanization, which Professor Bullitt just referred to, is the period from 1100 to 1300, the great warming of Europe, which was the peaceful period in European history. So cities developed during a peaceful time in Europe's history. The early modern period when the real excitement happens about pre-industrialization is in fact a terribly bloody period in Europe. It is the most bloody. The medieval gets a very bad rap about uh, its violence and warfare. It's the 16th and 17th century there, the horrific centuries in terms of sort of marauding soldiers, uh, destruction of cities. This is the, the period of the sack of Antwerp, of Ghent, of Malines, of, um, of cities in the south. So um, it may be that European cities were safer, but I don't know quite how that fits with the argument that they're making, except with possibly with regard to capital costs and labor costs. Labor costs were higher in cities. Um, and I have a remark about that that I want to make in a minute. And capital costs may have been cheaper in cities. I mean, they were in Europe. Capital was easier to obtain. The institutions to protect your investment, your loans, were more robust in cities, etc. But that's in a way a circular argument. That's where the commerce was. That's where the merchants were. So that's where the systems existed for, for raising capital. Um, the way most European historians understand this, this social topography of Europe in which cities are indeed walled with turrets and watches and soldiers and all those sorts of things. Um, as though defending themselves from the countryside, and they are in fact defensive, most of them, is that they were different kinds of political entities. They were intrusions on a landscape with a different jurisdictional authority, different law, different customs, and a different economy. And so the argument I would make about why industry, and by that he, they mean and I mean in this context, commercialized industry winds up being located in cities is because it's the way the citizens, i.e. people who have rights as citizens in the city as opposed to being subject to a lord in the countryside, is that they, that's how they protect property rights. 
that's how they keep a claim on their property. So these cities, which were in fact defensive, were also jurisdictional spaces subject to different laws. They were, and here Weber still makes some sense, they were markets. They were the places where markets were centralized in Europe. Um, and they, um, you know, we, this is the period where something that the English continue to call law merchant um, developed. And on the continent where that term doesn't really exist, there were nevertheless a specific set of commercial laws that developed to adjudicate contract disputes, to decide about whose property was whose, etc., that did not obtain in origin in the, sit in the countryside because different system and different kinds of lawmakers prevailed. So I would say that cities were not refuges from warfare. In fact, um, they were not, they were only sporadically at war with these people in the countryside. They were regularly doing business with them. They were supplying them arms, they were supplying them luxuries, they were supplying them the trinkets that both constituted and consolidated their power as a military elite in the, in the period. So, um, and the industry that was located in cities, and this brings me to the labor issue, um, was a luxury industry in origin. The commerce in cities was commerce both in luxury goods that were made in the cities, but also in imported luxury goods, goods that came from lots of times Asia, from far away, or from other parts of Europe. And the, the industry that built these famous cities that you know, we, um, we think of as the motors of European economic development in the late medieval and early modern period were in fact producing highly specialized goods with a highly specialized, closely controlled labor force. Um, and they were using imported materials to do it. The cloth industries in the part of the world I work in, the cloth industries were huge. That, that wool came from specific places in Europe through a very sophisticated merchant network that had access to that wool. The dyes that they used, which constituted up to 50% of the cost of a finished piece of cloth, came from, a lot of them came from abroad. The metal industries, which is the other great thing, depended on mines in the Meuse Valley, Moravia, Bohemia, etc. And so that too was in the hands of a merchant network that got that stuff to the cities. So we're not talking about labor. We're talking about a highly skilled specific labor force that was in cities. And the task of controlling that labor force, training it, preserving the property rights of the citizens in the city was the job of the cities, um, as opposed to uh, the countryside. Now, th this, you know, in theory, all this kind of production, the raising of capital, the importing of the luxury raw materials, the jewels from India to decorate all those things you see in museums that were made in Nuremberg and places like that, um, that could have been done in the countryside under a different kind of political system. It wasn't in Europe. Apparently, it was in China. But it wasn't in Europe, I think, for the reason that the sort of gross reason that I've outlined is that this was uh, under the control of what they called the bourgeoisie. And they didn't already mean the Marxist bourgeoisie. They meant the urban citizen. Um, so I think that that, I, I would, kind of revised my sense of why cities in Europe and this peculiar social topography of Europe, and I would place it in this political history of what is loosely called feudalism in, in Europe. Now, the fact that commerce was centralized in cities and luxury industries were centralized in cities does not mean that the countryside did not commercialize. And in fact, the commercialization of the countryside in Europe is a, is a big part of the story of the industrialization of Europe. Um, even in the Dark Ages, there were markets in the countryside. There was always some market exchange of some limited kind. But the big story is, of course, the agricultural revolution of the 16th and 17th century in Europe, when um, 
what had been a system that was organized for subsistence production with a peripheral connection to the market gets turned into a system that is producing for the market. And of course, England is the great story where that happens most clearly, but it happens in many places in Europe as well. What that does is two things. Number one, it produces a, a landless class of former peasants, people that lose their land. The, there's a whole social history written about the landless men of early modern Europe and their revolutionary potential, but also their availability for cheap uh, wage labor. The other part of the story of what is crudely thought of as producing a working class for the eventual industrial revolution, which does depend on unskilled, low-wage labor, is the parcelization of land in what's left of the peasant community. And northern France and Belgium, are, and then some areas around Switzerland and in the Rhineland, are places where this increasing parcelization, too many people survive, the land gets divided up, the people, you don't have enough land to support yourself as a peasant, you take in wage work of various kinds, industry spreads to the countryside, you get this famous thing called proto-industrialization, and this becomes in a complicated way the cheap labor that's available for the story of urban for industrialization. So that's my quibble that turned into maybe a bigger point. Um, I'm going to close with just two general points. I wondered as I read two of these chapters and a pricey of the book and then listened tonight with great interest, um, I never heard the word capitalism. Um, I heard growth, market, um, efflorescence, industrialization, etc. Now, I'm not going to try to, I already tried to resurrect one little piece of Weber. I'm not going to try to resurrect the sort of old Marxist story, which has run its course. But I do want to ask why we're not going to think about class. We're not going to think about the fact that even non-Marxists will agree, or people that were never intrigued by a Marxist narrative, will agree that um, Europe produced, in the early modern period, a class of entrepreneurs who were rewarded for taking risks in the marketplace, punished for failure in the marketplace, and in fact compelled, in a certain sense, to compete for profits. Um, most historians understand that it's a social phenomenon that is, if not particular to Europe, not, uh, um, or if not unique, then a particular kind of social formation that, uh, did, if this is not a relevant part of the story of Europe's industrialization, which for a full century historians have argued that it was, why is it not? Why do we not need to think about that anymore? And it's not that I'm talking about the celebration of the bourgeoisie or something. I'm thinking about class. Um, the fact that we have a, a labor force that's produced um, to occupy a certain class-like position, that we have an entrepreneurial class that emerges. Now this leads me, um, so one of my questions is, if, if we're not gonna talk about capitalism, why not? There has to be a reason not to. Um, the other last thing I want to say is I want to come to culture and I was terrified when you were talking and I thought, oh dear, I have to think of another word. I, I couldn't think of one, so I'm going to come back to, to culture. Um, now at its heart, industrialization is the application of technology to production, right? And we already have from Dick Bullock some explanation of the of European exceptionalism, at least with respect to the Ottoman world. Um, now, our authors have a very elegant, beautiful explanation that labor costs were high in Europe and so it made sense to apply machines and replace labor. This does a nice job of addressing this sort of perennial problem that here we have China, this technologically advanced, certainly in 1400 and 1500 compared to Europe, that didn't do that. I mean, one of the things that's in all the textbooks that still are in high schools, the Chinese invented fireworks, but they never, you know, blew up the world with them. Um, so 
Um, so it do, that does, that the Europeans have an economic incentive to find technological solutions to production because of high labor costs. Um, I think then you, if, if that is true, and may be true, I think we need a fuller story that is really culture, a cultural story about how Europeans learned to apply technology, how the technological knowledge circulated, why, um, why, and this is the hardest question of all, why it seemed like a good idea for a miller, the guy that knew how to run the windmill or the water mill that um, uh, Dick Bullitt was talking about. Uh, yes, he may have said, oh dear, my, you know, my donkey is too slow and, and eats all my food, and so I'm not going to use my donkey to ride the, to make the water mill turn. Um, why and how did that man decide that there was a, another system, right? How did he learn? Um, and so this, it, it seems to me, brings us back to the question of class, not just class in the sense of a group of people whose status socially and politically depended upon their ability to amass finance and productive capital, uh, but also a class of people who had access to the kind of technological training, the technological tools that could be put to work. And there's, there's good work now being done in Europe. Uh, Maxine Berg has a new book uh, about the sort of inventors in England, fiddlers. Um, and it seems to me that that kind of history has to be included in the history that we're trying to compare. I have no idea whether this did or didn't go on in China. But, so. <laughs> Well, I want to thank all three discussants uh, for the comments. They cover a large range of issues, and I'm, I, I will seek to, uh, in some sense, uh, organize the response in terms of the book has, uh, I should make clear, it makes a series of arguments that look at specific problems, like household structure, demography, the way it's been argued, and the reasons we think it's a false set of arguments. Um, similarly, in the chapter I talked about, about uh, uh, market development, both um, credit and transactions, uh, commercial transactions, um, the way people have stylized differences of formal and informal and how we go about taking that apart. Um, and that's one of the styles of argument, uh, a basic element in the argument of the book. Um, it seems to me, um, let me start with Professor Howell's comments and say that uh, they, they're important and they affirm a line of inquiry, which is what one expects in the history profession about uh, essentially where are the things that I know that we study to explain what happened in Europe? Why aren't they part of your story and what does it mean that they're not there? So I want to try to explain what, why they're not there and there are different reasons and why, um, what the significance of this is. Firstly, uh, starting with the issue of cities and um, what, why do we say cities are a place to which entrepreneurs go uh, because of the threat of warfare? It's very specifically um, to protect their capital. It's to protect, in other words, insofar as being behind walls is safer than being in the countryside, or th that's what's projected at least, that it, you would prefer to be behind city walls to protect your capital. That says nothing about all the reasons walls are built or all the reasons urban growth takes place. It makes no claims about there not being other factors that explain why cities develop, either in Europe or for that matter in other parts of the world. So what's crucial is that we're, we're just making a specific claim about why people would want to move into cities because of warfare and what the consequences of that action might be for the kinds of economic uh, activity that takes place. And it proceeds on the assumption that there are going to be certain types of activities, and textiles to some extent would be an example of this. I mean, it seems, I mean, it, it's a great disadvantage to all of us that Jean Laurent isn't here because he would be able to talk more about the low countries and the wool textiles than 
Um, I'm, I'm dredging up uh, what I had to read for my oral exams for David Hurley, which was 30 some. It's a hell of a long time ago. I don't. It's not very safe for me to depend on that kind of knowledge, um, and that's why one works with colleagues so you don't have to keep up with these literatures. But anyway, the point is that. Um, the argument proceeds on the assumption, and Jean Laurent here, I hope he present examples of why we think the argument obtains in Europe as well, that for certain types of textiles, the equivalent kind of activity, and it's hard because Chinese are using more cotton, while yeah. Europeans are using more wool, and they, those are different technologies, et cetera, et cetera. But the point is that, that they're in urban places in Europe where they would be in the countryside in China. Now, the question if you're gonna compare is you need commensurate kinds of information to compare how things work so that differences between those two cases help you explain other differences. So methodologically, describing what goes on in one place rather than the other can't really motor you towards that kind of explanation. The kinds of explanations that we're, we typically do in terms of accounting for what we empirically observe in a given world region, in this case Europe, does tell us people are in cities, well, the economic reason they're in cities, Rosenthal and I are suggesting, can be reduced to the issue of security of capital. It really doesn't address how the city is structured. Um, all the features you talk about are the context within which they're in cities. But, um, and if we find, well, Chinese cities are not like that. I mean, this is, in a sense, the Weberian uh, yeah. argument. The causal significance of those differences in economic terms is actually difficult to evaluate. By which I mean, uh, the fact that uh, this is an example of differences exist everywhere, but how do we evaluate what's the causal mechanism that we assign to that difference for other types of economic effects? I mean, we do it all the time, but it seems to me it's very hard to adjudicate the relative significance of all manner of difference. In this particular case of, of, of cities as sites of production, it just seems to us that by the 16th century, there is a difference in craft industries, the frequency with which they're in the countryside versus cities, and that to us seems a key, a key element in that has to do with the threat of warfare in a, in a given space. This comes right back to Maddie's uh, second or third point, I no longer remember which one it was. Um, it's actually number two. Um, it's an exasperating point uh, to me uh, because uh, she mentioned two things, costs and she um, also talked about the scale of the military. The argument in way said, in fact, we have a paragraph that reminds people of all the bloody military campaigns that Qing undertook. The argument is not about the fact that Qing was not a massive military machine. The argument has to do with what, on average, millions of people in lot, a big chunk of China, not all of it, but a big space, didn't worry about troops marching through. Yes, there was a Ming-Qing transition, and there was civil war, and the civil war had major pockets. So there was disruption over literally 80 years. Well, that 80 years is a little different than the scale of threat of warfare, it seems to me. Uh, whether we start the Thirty Years' War or where we, where we march it through, it seems that it's, it's more, it, it, is a, it, it is of larger scale and greater duration in terms of threat in Europe than it is in China. So, in a sense, our argument is, is a contrast. It's a relative statement. It's not an absolute statement. And it's to isolate the fact that, on average, the people who are going to be engaging in economic activities, who are producing goods, are not going to run behind city walls in the Ming Qing period um, because of the threat of war. The threat of war was uh, typically on peripheries or on frontiers, and when it was more general than that, it was of more limited duration than Europe. So it's a relative argument. It's not an absolute that China didn't have a military. Well, it's a relative argument in two senses, where it's found and, and when it's found. And so I think, you know, and, and I, for certainly it is also debatable the extent to which this variable is that important. But it is something you can directly contrast between the two cases and say there's a difference in this and we think it's associated with another kind of difference. That's a causal mechanism. So many of these other things are instances of, well, Europeans have this and therefore they have other things. Well, for that, how, how do we uh, work through the mechanism? So here's an example. Of, and this is the challenge when we're uh, of getting symmetric kinds of information. 
Uh, Professor Howell ma mentioned Maxine's, uh, Maxine Berg's work and the issue of invention. Uh, there, there's been a lot of work in the last 15 years on Europeans' development of useful and reliable knowledge. Uh, that's the politically correct way to talk about science and technology in the early modern period. And, um, that's a, that's a, and I think that's a, use, uh, it's a good way to think of it. And so they ask what kinds of useful and reliable knowledge are, is there in other, in other parts of the world. And the fact that we know a lot about English and European invention in general, it doesn't tell us anything about what, took, uh, you know, what goes on in China. The typical, the standard way this is done is say, well, Chinese didn't have that, and therefore, they couldn't have something else. And until we know what they were doing, it's hard to know the significance of, of the existence of evidence for which we have no comparable data on the other case. I mean, that's, in, in, in terms of technology, that really is the situation we're in. And the, we feel there's a, an implicit and large danger in inferring from the absence of European practices in China then the other things don't happen. And the way we know that is in, econo in lots of economic history, um, we, we were taught 30 years ago that the Chinese didn't do things the way the English did. And Doug North's still trying to teach us that. Mm -hmm. uh, Douglas North, the Nobel laureate, and the people for mm -hmm. whom institutions are a very specific set of institutions. And that's a very powerful set of claims even today in development economics. And you know, there are all kinds of distinguished economists who are, who are telling us these things. And yet, as Maddie was mentioning, the fact that you can have different institutional mixes is one thing that historians have brought to the table. And the fact is, for some of these things in China, we don't yet know how mm -hmm. knowledge mm -hmm. circulated. So it's very hard to say how to measure the significance of the ways knowledge circulated in Europe compared to how they circulate in China, because the levels of the scholarship, as far as I can tell, are quite uneven. If we take, and this is one of the pieces I circulated uh, for this group, I think, um, it was a, 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 a piece I wrote on uh, Deidre McCluskey's <coughs> two, first two volumes of her now projected six-volume treatment of uh, bourgeois values, <laughs> virtues, dignity, <laughs> etc. Um, and you know, the exasperating thing about oh, one of the many exasperating things about that book is the rich detail she can give us on Dutch and English culture, using literary text, legal text, architecture. You know, good, or I don't know, I mean, I'll leave it to cultural historians to judge how good it is, but I mean, using the kind of evidence and, to my mind, a, a, a synthesis of the, of the argument one would want in that field, plus what she comes forward with is the residue of her Chicago economics training. Um, but the, you, the point is, so they have all that. How do I know what to compare that with, with China? Well, then these fascinating things happen where she says, well, you know, at a certain point in time, the Chinese have bourgeois virtues too. And I say, OK, well, why? And <laughs> it turns out, well, you know, there's no real explanation. We just told they got those values. And you sort of say, was it in the air? Did someone, did they really learn how to appreciate Rembrandt? I mean, what, what did they do to become, to have those values? And it's not really explained, uh, in my opinion. And um, when we corresponded on this, she just said I was a bit, uh, uh, what was, she chose a gentle adjective, um, but can, she called me crabby or something like that. <laughs> uh, you're a bit crabby. And I thought, uh, no, I'm more than crabby. I don't think what you're doing makes sense. And I think that's a problem with cultural arguments that aren't anchored in commensurate efforts at evaluation. So I, I think that's one of the challenges we face in responding to thick descriptions analytically focused on one part of the world, in this case Europe, and not knowing how to uh, uh, you know, judge uh, equivalent things in, in the Chinese case. Um, I've already mentioned something about the military uh, issues. It's not a question of expenditures in the sense that the Chinese didn't spend a lot of the military. They did. What we try to argue in the book is, but note on margin, not all of it went to the military. I mean, uh, tr almost, the, almost all public funds uh, state making fu uh, state funds went to military at certain points uh, in early modern European history, and we know how important that th the failure to keep up with that was to uh, the security of polities and the ways in which the institution they could deal with that. And a lot of and, and so that's very important politically, but the issue of how it's important um, economically is, is, I would say, a different issue. So I, I would move from the military issue to the uh, issues you raise about uh, public goods provisions. I think uh, when you say that's a crucial part of the argument, I think it is one of the arguments we make. I don't think the, the war and manufacturing 
argument doesn't depend on the public goods argument, it's the public good. I mean, th these are somewhat separate arguments. I mean, we would argue we're trying to address different issues and exemplify an approach. And the approach does come up with the uncomfortable proposition, uncomfortable to the conventional wisdom, that the Chinese on average provided better, pub more public goods of a economically productive nature or, or useful to the economy than did Europeans. And in particular, this has to do with the fact that we as a China field still don't adequately deal with, with, with the significance of water control, it seems to me, because we know it's important institutionally. We know we don't believe in a Vitrolian hydraulic society and autocracy, and yet we haven't really sorted through and assembled the kind of data that allows us to say, look how much the Chinese spent, and let's start making estimates of how, what they gained from that in terms of the product. We know paddy agriculture is much more productive per unit area, area, and we know that the, the maintenance of marine waterways was fundamental to the, the transport that allowed the expansion of that commercial economy. But as far as I can tell, we haven't done much effort or done a good job at all of actually estimating these kinds of infrastructural costs, the role of the government in making those possible. And we've missed them in part, um, I'll just do this as quickly as I can. In the 18th century, officials often to repair irrigation works. There was nothing in their budgets to allow this. And they deliberately borrowed from one budgetary item, did the work, then they did a temporary surtax on the land and replaced it into the uh, original budget item. It never turns up in a budget. So if you're doing the reconstruction of budgets and what the Chinese are doing, you'll never see it. Except you, if someone's impeached for having well, that's the, the exactly yeah. unless unless somebody <laughs> had the misfortune true. to borrow the money and not get it back in the account before someone came and said, "Hey, you screwed up." Mm -hmm. But the point is, it was structured so that officials were very vulnerable, and I can't, I don't have time to explain all the, re and that's a whole set of issues about how the bureaucracy works. But in terms of the public finance feature of it, it means that one of the basic things Chinese did in the 18th century to maintain where the government spent money and then raise money for water control, we cannot pick up very systematically. And uh, most people who have looked at this haven't even bothered to recognize that this is actually a pervasive phenomenon. So it's that kind of problem that makes the argument Rosenthal and I make about public finance difficult to empirically, you know, to produce the kind of happy, happy meaning solid figures. I mean, when John Brewer wrote The Sinews of Power uh, and talked about this vast increase in the fiscal size of the 18th century English state, he could do so because the expansion of the state was predicated on the bringing in all these excise customs and all this, and it got great records. The kind of fiscal uh, things that the Chinese did, uh, they had ideological reasons for claiming minimal government, and when they even did things, they liked to find ways uh, of, 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 until the second half of the 19th century, for not even telling us how they did it. I mean, they, um, that was part of the way they, they did things, crudely put. That doesn't make it easy for us to make commensurate comparisons, but in any event, the chapter we have on that was at least a provisional effort to point us towards an argument. And there, I should also say that we were consciously thinking of the way economists think about the problem of public goods, and there is this important theory in public finance that imagines that democracies do a better job of provisioning of public goods than uh, non-democracies, and, and their reasons uh, theoretical reasons, that's an important argument. And we wanted to find a way to qualify that so we could demonstrate that the limits of that as an explanation. So that had a very specific kind of um, method, uh, theoretical motivation behind it. That, again, that issue is very distinct from the market institutions issue, which is in turn distinct from the uh, warfare manufacturing. All of them are united by um, I think, a, a common methodological approach to how we evaluate these things. Um, Professor Bullitt's uh, comments were fascinating, uh, and as I interpreted them, uh, largely not related to what we were uh, doing. Uh, and therefore, I...